So the, so the material we'll talk about today uh, relates to a continuation on related to, um, to site investigation. And so the previous um, episode, 7.1, uh, talked about methods of drilling. And you'll recall that the different methods of drilling depended on whether you're drilling in soil, in which you could do things like augering with solid stems or hollow stems, sometimes using um, tricone bits and air flushing techniques. Uh, but if you're in rock, you had to use either diamond coring or tricone drilling. And so there was a division between different methods that you could use um, if you're looking at advancing holes in uh, soil or rock. And so once you've advanced those holes, with some of those methods, you don't actually get any samples. With diamond coring, you do, because the sample goes up inside the drill string, snaps off at the bottom like a cookie cutter, um, and then is retrieved to the surface. But where you're just pushing down, uh, washing out rock chips uh, up to the surface, then there is no intrinsic sample except for those rock chips to come to the surface. And so we should talk about um, the sampling methods that are used for each of those uh, methods. Once you have a hole, and once you have samples retrieved from that hole, there's different distances. And the whole idea, of course, is to be able to recreate uh, the profile that you have used in your assignments so far. They, those just come to you magically. But, of course, there's a mechanism to be able to get those in the first place. And so uh, the other thing you might want to do with a relatively expensive uh, investment, and that is to instrument it in some way. And so not only do you want to know something about what the soils are or the rocks are, um, you want to know something about the crucial properties that we've talked about in this class. Permeability is one, entry pressures and capital pressure relationships are others. And so you might want to measure those in some way in situ. And by putting in piezometers to measure pressures and by doing flow tests to measure permeabilities, you actually get some information about the physical properties of the soil which might be useful in your design. Um, and then separate from those, so these two methods, if you like, relate to drilling a hole first and then either taking a sample or instrumenting that hole uh, and using it in some useful way. The other thing that you might want to do is instead of drilling at all, in soils you can do uh, continuous profiling, sometimes referred to as cone penetration testing, which we'll talk about uh, in some detail which also gives you the same information, but is only applicable to be used for soils, not for, for rock. And so we'll spend some time talking about these different met methods today, mechanisms today, and look at some uh, photos and uh, movies, I guess, of different things going on, just to give you some appreciation for those. So if we take the first of these first, so sampling in soil and rock, Actually, this is quite a nice figure that explains most of the important features. And so we made this distinction between soil and rock, um, but we can also make a distinction in soils that they come in two different modalities. They come as cohesive soils, which are clays and silts, which hold together. You could ball them in your hand, and if I threw them at you, you'd get hit by the snowball. Um, and not that I will, of course. And sands, which are cohesionless, which if you imagine throwing sand with water in it, it disintegrates. And so the same issues relate to trying to sample them, because if you try and sample cohesionless soil, sands, they fall apart and you can't actually retrieve them very well. And so the two different methods that are used, grossly used, are for uh, sands and, and coarser, I guess. So gravels, small gravels, are to use what's called sometimes a split spoon, which here is called a split barrel, and is often sometimes referred to as a, a thick-walled cylinder or a thick-walled sampler, because what it is is a tube uh, that goes onto the drill rod. So these are threads here that attach onto some drill rods. It's taken down to the bottom of the hole and it's banged in physically into the ground until uh, soil comes up from this shoe all the way up into this, um, the open annulus of this thing. The walls of this are probably a couple of millimeters thick. 
Uh, it's split, it's a cylinder that's physically split in two, but joined with a shoe on the bottom end and a connection at the top end. And when it's put down the hole and then, then driven in, it takes a sample. There's a, sometimes a small core catcher here. So if you imagine a comb, comb in your hair, wrapped around, it allows things to come in through the bottom of this sampler, but not to drop out. It's just a, a spring steel holder that stops it from dropping out. You bang it into the ground, you bring it up to the surface, you take the shoe off, which is this. You take it from the back end of this, you open it up into two pieces, and you take the soil sample out, and you um, uh, bag it and take it to the lab, and maybe recompact it and do permeability experiments on it. But it's basically for um, soils which are uh, cohesionless sands. Um, and this little thing here is a ball bearing, which allows you to bang it in, but there'll be a whole bunch of water in the drill string. And so when you pull this out, the tendency is for that water to rush through the sample and just wash it out. So this actually acts under gravity. It closes and doesn't allow it to, to be removed. So for, for granular materials, you use a, um, a split barrel. This is a bit like this. Actually, you can see this little core catcher here. These um, co comb tooth, which stop the sample from dropping out. The other kind of sampler, I guess, same as this. This is a split barrel. It's just different um, configurations. It is the converse, and converse is called a thin-walled sampler. Sometimes called a Shelby too. I presume after the inventor. And it's a bit offset here, but if you imagine something, a uh, brass tube, which is probably a millimeter thick, has a, an end on it that's sharp enough to cut you, that's attached onto the same kind of mandrel that would be on the drill rod, which is pushed down the hole. And then this is lowered down the hole to the bottom of the hole, and instead of being physically banged into the ground, it's just pushed into the ground under the action of the drill rig. And more like a cookie cutter, the clay... And so this is for clays and silts. We'll just rise up in here up to the top. You twist it, like twisting off, like really like a cookie cutter, to break it off at the base. And then you pull it up through the hole to, to take this sample up to the top. And again, it has this little ball bearing in here. It's a check valve to stop the water that's in the drill pipe from physically forcing this thing out. Uh, and certainly those work really well for clays, which are quite sticky. Um, silts are kind of part, so if you go from clays to silts to sands to gravels, that's kind of the gradation of things. Silts, if they're full of water, um, they're not very uh, frictional, and they'll actually just wash out of here. And so an innovation, if you like, on these samplers is sometimes called piston samplers. Um, this is a split barrel, but anyway, just ignore that. And the idea here is, is as you push it, push it into the ground, you have this piston that's on the bottom of the sampler. And as you push it into the ground, the sample comes up through here, and this piston just retreats up with the top of the sample as it rises in the core tube. Once it's at the top of the core tube, then you twist it off, and then you retrieve it. Because there's no airspace between this piston and the top of your sample, there's a vacuum that develops if it tries to drop out. And that <coughs> vacuum physically holds the sample in here while you retrieve it up to the surface. And so there, so the, the, the basic idea is that there are two, two really different kinds of methods of sampling. One with a thick-walled cylinder, you get a disturbed sample for sands and gravels. You put it in the bottom of the hole and you bang it into the ground. Um, and the second is for things that are much um, finer-grained, cohesive, uh, such as clays and silts, where you have the same deal, but it's a much thinner wall, it's put into the bottom of the hole, and then it's just pushed into the ground and then, then retrieved. And we talked about uh, diamond core barrels last time. I think there's lots of narrative here on these different samplers as to why you might use them. Actually, on this sample, this uh, figure just shows all of them together, just as we talked about before. This is a thick-walled sampler, a split spoon, with a shoe on it to bang into the ground, very sturdy. This, by 
comparison is this very thin walled steel tube, steel or brass tube, uh, which is sharp enough to cut at the base, which is physically pushed into the ground. This is the assembly for a, um, a piston sampler where you have this piston going up into it. So all three of these, if I mark these, these are all for soils, either being banged into sands or being pushed into silts and clays for these. Two in the middle are for silts and clays. One on the left is for um, sand. All three are for soils. And the final one on the right-hand side is a core barrel for rotary drilling. So this is where you abrade the material at the tip of this by letting it go in. As it abrades the material around the tip, the core rises within the core barrel. Uh, once you get a 5-foot length or a 10-foot length, depending on the size of your core barrel, then you stop drilling and you either pull a drill string up the hole or more normally, as you'd have seen in 7.1, you put a fishing tool down here, you grab the core barrel on a wire line, and you extract the core barrel through the drill string, leaving the drill string in place, take the core out, put another core barrel down, and then restart drilling. And so that's the, the mechanism. And I'm pretty sure you, you looked at some, some of those in, in uh, progress in uh, the Caribbean. So it's not unusual that your first job as an entry-level engineer might be to be on site on a drill rig. And typically the logging of material is done by um, a professional. That's you, by the way, will be, maybe in a couple of months. Um, and to record the material on a drill log. And so it's ex sufficiently expensive. It might be 5 or 10 or 20 or $30 a foot, linear foot to drill. And so you want to do something with the information that you get. It typically gets recorded on a, rock, a log. This one is one that's developed for Gold Associates, um, a company both in the U.S. and Canada. This is out of that Canadian office. Uh, and you can see on this, uh, if you look at this, so this drilling record on the left-hand side talks about going through, if I just scoot this down. So the drilling record is one where it's, it's in meters, Canadian, um, through soil, hit rock at 7.2 meters and it records the different methods of drilling and it records some different things about the material that's gone down and it records the completion method on the right hand side. So I'll zoom into that. So if you look on this, the description of the, um, the drilling, so it says a power auger, 150 millimeter diameter, hollow stem to get through the soil and the grouted steel casing is put in this. This is for uh, the Smithville site, actually, which you've worked with. Uh, once you get to rock, you no longer do it with a hollow stem auger because you can't. And so this is air flush rotary core drill, no samples taken, and also uh, in a HQ diameter hole, which is 96 millimeters, uh, it says. I can never remember the size of these. It gives you some log, which you probably can't read here, which describes the material that's recovered from the sampling. And then it talks about the different things that are recovered on the top. So a symbolic log of what the soil was, um, what kinds of samples that were taken as you went down. So this is rotary core, HQ diameter, etc. Some information about how much core is recovered out of the total how much of it was solid. Rock quality designation is how many pieces are bigger than four inches uh, individually, or what proportion of the, the total core length is, are in pieces that are larger than four inches. If it's very small, it means the quality of the rock is very poor. Um, the number of fractures per 0.3 meter, which is fractures per, per foot. The orientation of those fractures, their dip, um, zero, deg uh, yeah, zero degree dip, 90 degree dip, uh, the range here, some description of the surfaces, measurements of hydraulic conductivity if they were made in the field, and that relates to the final completion. And so I guess we'll talk about it a bit later on, but the completions in the hole is ha what was actually done with the hole once it was left, left in place. And typically you don't want to leave an open hole because it's now a great conduit for fluids to go from this zone that used to be isolated all the way through these other zones which were isolated from it and now are not. 
And so typically you'd complete it so that you'd either plug the hole with grout so there's no flow at all, or maybe more usefully, put in a piezometer so you can actually measure the permeability of the formation in situ uh, by pumping water into it. And so this is some graphic of that uh, construction. So there's a plastic tube that goes all the way up from the base of the hole up to the surface, maybe a one inch diameter PVC tube. Um, in the part that's within the formation, there's sand that's put around it as a filter um, to fill up the hole and stop it collapsing. And then it's capped at the top on the outside of this uh, tube with uh, grout to be able to have a, an impervious plug so that this zone no longer communicates with the stuff above it. And then in that, you could run an experiment that hasn't been done here. You could run an experiment by pumping water in to be able to measure the permeability and then plot that on the log as well. And so a log would typically include all of those, those details. So what do we have to support that? We've looked at these last time. Where's the last one that I wanted? It's this one, I think. So this is uh, so this is a site. Doesn't matter where it is. It happens to be Massachusetts in December. Uh, this is a piston sampler, and so if you look at this, this is the the piston that goes down to the base. This is the uh, assembly of the uh, that it goes into as it's lowered down hole. And so this is the the Shelby tube or the thin barreled uh, tube with the piston right at the base. So this would be put on the end of some drill string, pushed down the hole. This would be f facing the soil on the bottom of the hole. And then the cookie cutter around it is advanced while this stays static and goes, cuts the cookie, twist it, and then you retrieve it while pulling a vacuum with this piston to make sure that nothing, nothing falls out. Uh, we looked at those last time see everyone deliberating exactly what that is. So this is exactly that same tube with the piston now retracted up to the top with the sample not in there anymore. Same deal. So you see this is the piston. This is um, a diameter that's slightly smaller than this collar. So the thin Shelby tube fits over this up to this seat here. And then there are two recessed um, screws that are screwed all the way in, but you put the piston on here and then you unscrew these screws so they come out through the holes within the top of that Shelby tube and lock it on. And, and you can see that right here. So these are those those individual holes. So this is the Shelby tube, this is on the seat, these are the individual screws that come out, and this is the, the business end with the piston already down at the bottom, ready for deployment. And this is with it come out. So it's now been taken off the mandrel. This would be attached to the drill rods. This is the cookie cutter, if you like. Open at the top. This is the hole within this thin walled cylinder. And this is uh, the sharp cutting shoe. And the gray stuff is just a sample um, clay that's come out of the, the ground. You can measure strength on these things as an index property. And so one way to do that is just to take this little tor vein, uh, which is just a little torque wrench. So if you imagine something that you can twist that has a spring on it that t increases the torque until it finally goes. And the reason it goes is because this fails. Um, and this interface is just a bunch of little, um, these are the little veins. So if you imagine pushing this physically into the clay so that these little flat um, feet, if you like, cut into the clay and grab it. You twist it until they fail. When it fails, it just moves rotationally, and that allows you to convert that into a, a strength, which is used as a, an index property to decide whether it's a stiff clay or a soft clay, and then define the properties of it. And so once you've spent all this time and effort getting this nice sample, you like to keep it from drying out, so the usual ways to preserve it is to cut some of the material out of here, maybe a couple of inches back, uh, and then to seal it with wax. 
So you have a tin can full of wax, a tiger torch, you melt it, and then you fill up the top so it's sealed with wax on one end, turn it upside down, do the same at the other end, and so you have this nice pristine sample you can take back to the lab. You can extrude it, extrude it out of the, um, the sample, and you can use it, say, to run permeability tests. So, hot stuff. So this has the, um, the wax in it. It's capped with plastic, and it's marked in some ways to, to be able to identify it. Coming out of the hole, these are the little set screws that are present. This is the drill string, which is up the mast on the, uh, the machine. This is the end after it's had <coughs> these Torvein samples. This is taking it off the tool, so some of these, I guess, in reverse order. These are the marks that are made from that little torque wrench, which uh, the torque vein, which measures the strength. Uh, disconnected from the piston sampler. And all this is it's just like a torque wrench. It goes around, it registers the highest torque that it, you applied, which is 2.2 somethings, kilograms per square centimeter. And that defines the, the strength. Yeah, that's not a bad picture of it. So that's all it is, just a a spring that applies a torque until it finally gives. Okay. What else did I have? I had another one. Okay. How do I get rid of that? I do that. Put something on my desktop, which was maybe this stuff in action. Let's see if this runs. I didn't review this. Okay. I guess it's a bit blurry if you just you stop it, so maybe I won't stop it. So I'll just it through it to see where this is going. So, I, so this is actually a site that's not really a going on. This is probably how you watch your notes. Five, five, good efficient way to do it. Stuff you know you don't need to look at again. Focus on the stuff you don't. And so because this isn't really the yeah the ubiquitous use of a tiger torch. And yeah, so I'll play it in Boston blue clay.
So the main reason for doing this is not to look at that, but to look at other methods of Once you're at the depth of the you want to take the second spoon side. Okay. See what's going on here. So this is the the drill string that's going into the hole. This is a solid tube with a larger tube on the outside, which is basically working as a hammer. And I'll just let this run. And so at the bottom of it, this is drill steel with this split spoon sampler touching the bottom of the hole. This is uh, just a capstan with two loops of rope around it. It goes up into the mast, comes down, and attaches itself to the bottom, top of this heavy weight. You pull some, you put some pressure on the capstan. It raises this weight up onto the mast, and then it drops down, I think, a foot. And it's a certain weight, a standard weight. It drops down three feet, and it drives this thing into the ground. You measure the number of um, blows it takes to go a foot, and that's a measure also of the strength of the material it goes through not so much use for us but also by doing that it physically gets driven into the soil and it takes this sample that is then recovered from the hole so different from the thin walled cylinders for taking clays which are placed in the bottom of the hole and physically pushed by the drill mast and then extracted this is actually basically beaten into the ground uh, by using this and so let's see where this goes if we speed it up bang it into the ground I don't recall whether it shows a, uh, a retrieved sample. Apparently not. Okay. Well, maybe. Yeah. So just continuing and drilling. So then you take the sample, you put string in the um, the joints to be able to seal them to keep the water in there, and uh, you advance another few. Okay. Oh, actually, this is worth watching. And so you go through so you go through sands and gravels to take the samples from that. Once you get beyond that and you're in clay below that, then you put this thin walled sampler on. This is the sampler, this is the kind of piston arrangement. It's going onto the drill street steel uh, there. It's going to be raised up and put into the hole at some stage. Or not, as the case may be. Trying to measure exactly what the depths of these things are, the depth of the hole, so you know where to to set it. Measuring the length of the tool, so you know if you know how much drill steel you have on it. Lowering it into the hole, which is what's happened here. Thinking about it some more. Oh, this is retro retrieving it. So now it's had the cookie cutter pulled into it, I think. And, uh, no, I guess that was tightening it, maybe. Yeah, and then taking care of frozen lines, pushing it into the ground, then retrieving the sample, taking the sample off, and then doing all the things that we saw previously that you can do with it. In this case, you can see that it's um, it's crimped the, the end of this. So it's, it's not pure clay in the bottom. It's hit a, a, a boulder that's in the clay or a cobble that's in the 
clay and, and left that. Okay? All right. We'll leave that. All right, so we're done with that. Okay. So we made the case that it matters what you're sampling. And so if we look at these different methods. So we talked about sampling soil and rock. I think last time you saw sampling in rock with the, um, uh, the wire line, so we won't talk about that again. But if you have this expensive uh, installation, uh, which is a hole, then it often pays something to do something with it. And so the thing that we talked about on the drill log is the form of completion. And completions would typically think about putting in a piezometers. And piezometers come in a variety of different uh, forms. By far, the most common is just a tube that's put into the bottom of the hole. Um, it's put all the way down to the bottom of the hole. It's backfilled with sand around it. And then uh, grouted at the top, as you saw in that borehole log, so that you don't have any communication. But there are more sophisticated ones. You can also put pressure transducers down the hole, uh, which would just measure the pressure. Uh, but the disadvantage of that is you can't actually take water quality samples. You can measure the pressures, which is great, but if you want to actually physically access and bail the hole to be able to take a water quality sample, then you need to have a physical direct connection. So the kinds of piezometers that either use a pneumatic element, so the idea is that you have a, um, a membrane that covers a port, the port goes all the way up to the surface, and you have a second line. And so this membrane is acted on by the fluid pressure that's acting against it in the subsurface. If the fluid pressure is higher than the pressure acting against it, the air pressure on the inside, then there's no hydraulic connection between the downline and the upline. If the fluid pr gas pressure is increased, the air pressure, until the membrane comes off this seat, and all of a sudden it can make a connection between the upline, and you know that the pressure that you have to apply on this line here has to be exactly the same as the water pressure acting against it. And so immediately you know what the water pressure is. Except by using that, you can't actually take a fluid sample. So again, this doesn't allow you to take a fluid sample. Typical pressure transducers also work on the same process or the same principle. They have a membrane. Uh, the membrane is pushed against by water, uh, it bends the membrane, and you measure the deflection of the membrane with a little strain gauge, and that allows you to say something about the magnitude of calibrated against the pressure. And again, in this, you can only measure the pressure, but can't take samples. So by far, the most common installation is to have a piezometer placed within a borehole and either uh, cemented in place or... Um, used as a packer. And so those would look like this. So the two ways you could imagine to complete this would be to have an open hole uh, that you've drilled and spent a lot of money drilling. And if it's at the bottom of the hole, uh, this is one where there's already been one installation ab above it. So the bottom of the hole is now filled with a plug which is concrete, which is just grout that's dropped into the bottom of the hole denser than the water that's filling the hole, so it sinks to the bottom, it sets up, and then it acts as a, a plug, a seal. And so then, in this hole, which is open all the way to the surface, you take however many feet of uh, one-inch diameter plumbing tube, and you drop it down the hole. The tube has some perforations in it. You backfill around this tube with sand, again, just by dropping it into the hole and filling it up to some given location. And then above this, you do either two things. You pour grout into the hole that would plug it around all of the tubes that are coming up, not putting it down the tubes. Or you drop in little pellets, which might be the size of your, um, the tip of your small finger, which are compressed bentonite, which have a lacquer on them. They drop down to the bottom of the hole. The lacquer dissolves off. The bentonite gets wet. It swells. And it takes up, does exactly the same uh, job that a cement grout would do, is that it makes this an impermeable seal on the top of it. So basically what you have is a zone which you can access only through this little one-inch diameter PVC pipe, 
all the way to the surface. Uh, it's in a permeable um, sand pack, which is much more permeable than the rock around it or the soil around it. And therefore, any fluid pressure changes that you have in here are measured by the water level within this pipe as it goes up to the surface. You can put a, uh, a probe down to measure where the water level is, and from that you get the water level within this individual location, and you know the pressure at that point. If you also pour water into this, then the water now will be higher than its equilibrium level, and so over time that water will just go down as it pours it itself or it pushes its way into the formation. And if you plot the rate at which, say, the head in that pipe changes as a function typically of log time, you get some kind of set of data points just by measuring it. You get a line between them. Then this gives you some measure of the permeability of your sign, of your of, of the material that's around your, your borehole. And so a very simple way is to do a, a falling head test, as it's called, because the head is falling as a function of time, and it allows you to calculate exactly what the, the magnitude of the, the permeability at a relatively large scale, you know, a couple of meters typically, is for this, this zone. And so that's the mechanism by which it works. This is a, a permanent installation. You might have a zone here. It might be grouted for another... 60 feet. You might have another zone which is a couple of uh, 10 feet tall with another piezometer, etc. So you could probably have five or six of these in a single well bore, tapping different zones depending on what you want to do. Or you could also use um, straddle packers, what are called straddle packers, which are basically the same idea, but instead of being a permanent installation where this stuff is grouted in, these are just um, neoprene sleeves, so you have a, a cylindrical mandrel uh, that are separated by a straddle. This length of separation is the straddle zone. Um, these um, mandrels have a sleeve of neoprene, just like a wetsuit material on them, that are accessed by a pressure line that goes all the way up to the surface, these pressure lines, and typically attached to a nitrogen cylinder. You open the gas, it inflates this just like a balloon. The balloon inflates against the walls of the hole, and by pushing against the, the hole, you can't get any fluid to go past here. You inflate the bottom and the top packers, and you basically have something that's just like this installation here, but it's a removable one because you can deflate these packers and move it up the hole. And so what you could do is you could inflate the packers, isolate this straddle zone, do a test within here to measure the permeability, just as we talked about for the piezometers, and then deflate these packers, move it a few meters up the hole, inflate them, and just repeat it. So you get a continuous profile of permeability all the way along your uh, hole if you wanted to do that. Um, some of the uh, contaminant hydrology sensors, uh, samplers, actually have a, a physical... Uh, packer system which may be a rod which might be 10 20 feet tall which has maybe on it 10 individual packers small packers but with a zone in between them that are sampled and so you place this down the hole they have two component fluids that get mixed and when they mix it's like the insulation you put in the walls of your house it expands and it inflates all of these in these 10 individual packers and with those 10 individual packers, you have nine individual zones between them, which are isolated and are able to sample to either do this kind of thing, to measure permeability by introducing fluids, or in this particular case, to be able to take uh, water quality samples out of them, to be able to measure the concentrations of different uh, dissolved um, species. And so but the same principle. This one is really done for measuring flow rates but you can also get them to be able to sample things in, in situ as well. And so, so those are methods of being able to seal a hole. We must have some pictures of that somewhere. That's not what I wanted to show. Something else. Come back to that. And so these are some underground labs. Um, this one happens to be in Korea, where these are just the pipes 
which are accessing these these boreholes, which are in an underground uh, experimental facility for nuclear waste. No nuclear waste, but to understand the, the hydrology of nuclear waste repositories. So these are just um, cables that go to a data logger, conveniently identified in English, not Korean, um, that access at the bottom of these holes, I think probably pressure transducers rather than piezometers, which measure pressure changes as a function of time. Same kind of arrangement in Japan. This is Mizunami, a kind of a, a granite experimental site for um, hydrology of, again, radioactive waste disposal. This is uh, someone taking samples um, from uh, these lines, or lines that access into the bottom of these boreholes that are isolated by packers and are able to um, sample the native fluids which are pr present uh, in place and someone taking the samples. Uh, this is another underground experimental lab in Switzerland in um, shales, actually in this case, in the French Jura. And I don't think these are holes that are not used for sampling but are somewhat similar. Wellbore breakouts in holes looking at the hydrology of um, faults. Faults are obviously um, fractured media that are able to transmit fluids. And these are some experiments to look at, for instance, the behavior of spent uh, nuclear fuel. So this is just a demonstration of what one of these experiments was. It's kind of a mock-up. It's actually in this uh, underground research lab. So these are little uh, containers that would contain uh, fuel rods, uranium-238 fuel rods, maybe 10 feet long going into the, uh, the adit. In each individual pixel here, maybe 10 of these fuel rods in an assembly, placed in the hole, back filled with bentonite, for the same reasons we just talked about it, as a, a method to be able to seal against any fluid flow, and then back filled, so it sits on this plinth, it's entered into here, into this canister, I guess this is this is a metal canister that's controlling it. This is a pressed bentonite um, plinth, I guess, that it's sitting on top of. And then all this backfill here is granular bentonite, which, if it gets wet, will swell and fill up the system. Yeah. So these are fuel rods. This is just a mock-up of this. This is a canister made of non-corroding material, either stainless steel or copper. This is a plinth that's made of pressed bentonite. And then this is kind of um, granules of bentonite which are filled around it, which once they get wet, they will swell and seal it. And this is the actual experiment, but it's actually a bit blurry. Yeah, this is an actual experiment of a real one, which is held in place, which has heaters in it to represent the fact that it'll get hot, to understand exactly what happens to the fluid pressures in this surrounding material to see what the migration resistance of that system would be over time. And this is the actual experiment. So an underground, maybe 200 meters underground in this uh, shale, it's such a clay shale with maybe a 20 meter long tunnel. The scale of this, this is for you to put your butt on. So this is a, a foot across, a little bit more than a foot across little railway line to go in here, all the data acquisition equipment coming out of here, and the instrumentation in this um, bentonite filled component with a bunch of heaters in it to be able to simulate the effects of decaying radioactive waste as it warms up the surroundings. St. Barbara, patron saint of miners. Uh, a different underground lab also in Switzerland in granite in the base of a, a dam to do similar experiments Stop on this. <coughs> to measure pore pressures in boreholes that go into this beautiful granite, very hard granite, and to measure the pressures in these individual zones. And I guess this is wrong. So this is, um, this is actually a huge packer, nothing like the ones we looked at, but this is a steel ring with an inflatable neoprene membrane on the outside and this is uh, that completely isolates it goes through a fault 
So the, the circular component goes through a fault. The fault comes down here. And so what it does is it seals the fault from water flow going into this adit so that you can actually measure flow rates and to do tracer tests inside this fault to measure its permeability. Again, in this case, for looking at radionuclides migrating in the, uh, the subsurface. Same thing. Lots of, uh, this is also another added in this particular underground research lab. So this is a packer. Uh, so we saw them before uh, with a straddle that separates them. These are just two packers put together without a straddle, just lying on the floor. And so you see here um, two pipes. So two pipes, one to inflate the upper packer, one to go all the way through the upper packer into the lower packer to be able to inflate that independently. And then they're just lowered down into a borehole and inflated. I'm not sure what these are. These are just nice pictures. And this is a zone on the straddle. So this is the zone. So this is probably a few inches. So this is maybe a, a foot and a half. Water gets poured into these, uh, the central piece of, it's like a piece of electrical conduit and pours into the formation and then flows into the rock that's surrounding it. Uh, and this zone is kept um, separated by this straddle length. And so that's the, the entire assembly attached that would be ultimately lo lowered down a borehole. Switzerland. And so this final one is, uh, you can't see it, but if you imagine that packer assembly, lower packer, upper packer, straddle zone, this is just a tripod that allows it to be lowered down into a, a borehole that happens to be in an underground research lab, Monterey in um, Switzerland, in, the, in western Switzerland, where you then do those experiments. I think that's the last one. Yeah. It's actually a bit more sophisticated in this case. The lower packer is down here which you can't have camera. The upper packer is here, and this just happens to have a piece of instrumentation in it that does some fancy things in measuring displacements in a borehole. I think that's the last one. Okay. All right. Um, so we made the case that there are these two different, three, three different functions that we'd like to do. The first is to be able to take samples, as we talked about that. The second is to maybe instrument it to measure pressures or to be able to take uh, water quality samples. And we can do that by using piezometers or packers. And the final method of being able to measure behaviors in situ is to do uh, continuous soil profile. And so in that case, we actually don't need any borehole at all because we basically make our borehole by doing this continuous profiling. Uh, there's some companies that provide these things. One of the more well-known one is called Geoprobe, who've made a, basically a cottage industry out of this. And the idea is actually quite simple. It's that in soil, instead of um, drilling a hole first, what you could do is you could take a probe and you could physically push this probe into the ground without pre-drilling a hole. It's like banging, in, well, not like banging in there, I guess it's more like screwing a screw into, into wood. And if you measure the forces that you have to apply to drive it into the ground uh, in a couple of different ways, and if you measure the pore fluid pressures that are developed as you drive it into the ground, then you can use that information to be able to say something about the properties of the soils that you're penetrating. And you can then draw a profile of exactly what those soils would be. And so the basic idea is you have a truck. A truck um, would have inside it the ability to physically push a probe down through the floor of the truck by using these rams on either side. And the probe would just be something that looks like a pencil, but is much larger than a pencil. It's probably an inch and a half in diameter, maybe just more than an inch in diameter. 
and it's equipped to be able to make these measurements. And so it's able to measure the force that you have to apply to push into the ground, and it rec would record that force as you go deeper and deeper. And it can measure that force in two different ways. You can imagine that if you have a load measuring element here, then that load measuring element will measure the force that is placed by the end bearing which is applied on this little tip of the cone. So that's one thing you could measure. So you could measure the tip resistance. So that's one thing. If you measure the force that gets applied here, then what you're measuring then, if you subtract off the amount that you have here, then this amount minus this would give you the so-called sleeve resistance. And so they're physically measuring two different things. This is measuring the end bearing of it. It's kind of the to fail the material ahead of this. And this is measuring, if you like, the frictional drag on the side of this um, sleeve. So by making those two measurements with depth, the tip resistance and the friction ratio, what you might be able to do is to look at maybe the ratio of those to be able to say uh, which was larger, more dominant. And if you think about pushing through sands where there's lots of friction on the side, then maybe this magnitude would be large and this would be relatively small, and in clays the opposite would be true. So if you had some empirical evidence of a borehole in different materials and a cone penetration test adjacent to it to calibrate it, you could look at these parameters and try and uh, develop empirical relationships as to what those ratios would be, what they'd say about whether it's a clay or a silt or a sand or a gravel. And so that's, that's one way to do it. The third important measurement you could make would be you could measure the the pore pressure that gets developed as you push it into the ground as well. Not just due to the fluids that are there and the pressure that's there in the pristine condition, but the pressures that you generate by pushing <coughs> this big piece of steel into the ground. Because as you displace the stuff around it and compress it, you'd expect that you'd compress the fluid within the pores. And as you compress the fluid in the pores, you raise the pressure. And if it's a really high permeability material, that increased pressure would drain off very quickly, and so you wouldn't really measure it. And so the measurement of the fluid pressure is another way to be able to characterize exactly what the materials are. So if you can measure these three principal properties, the tip resistance, the sleeve friction, and the fluid pressure, along with other things that you might want to use, then you can use that to be able to make some, to discriminate between the different um, soil types. And so this is the idea here. So these two charts show exactly that. So if you measure the friction ratio, it's given as a percent because it's the ratio of the frictional force that you measure relative to the stress that's in the ground. And so you can measure this from one of those profiles. So at every single point down here, it's a bit bizarre. Don't know why it did that. That's exactly what. So if you imagine taking any particular depth, you can measure all three of these properties. Right? You have a tip resistance at the, that depth, a friction factor at that depth, and a fluid pressure magnitude. If you know what the frictional resistance is, and you know what the end bearing is, then it locates you somewhere on this figure. And if you're in zone 4, as you are here, then it tells you that you're in silty clay to clay. And so instead of physically seeing what it is, the metrics of its behavior, uh, the strength of the materials, if you like, tells you something about what it is. And if you look at measuring the pore pressure and the tip resistance, again, finding yourself in a different location, you can confirm that that's the right location in terms of what that suggested is. You can also use the magnitude of the pore pressure to try and be able to say something about the permeability as well. So you can use these to be able to define uh, the magnitudes of this, the, the, the kinds of materials you have 
in place. And so if we look at this, what did I want to show? I guess I want to show this. Let's look at two things. Let's look at this and flash back through it. Maybe I'll locate this is exactly what I mean. So these are short um, clips. I'll cut down the sound. So this is in Turkey, um, near Izmir or Izmit. There's an earthquake um, 15 years ago that killed 20,000 people in Turkey uh, because the soil liquefied, a bunch of buildings collapsed when the foundations were gone. And this is doing, uh, f I guess, forensic investigations after the fact to measure the material that's present in the subsurface. And this is a very fast one, but, uh, but this is a cone penetration rig. And so you'll, some of these have picked fig figures. Yeah, this is the best picture. So this is one of these geoprobe rigs. It's on a little track. You drive it with um, a remote control that's tethered to it on an umbilical. So a pretty unskilled URI could uh, manage this. You drive it to where it needs to go. You raise this boom. Um, you physically uh, screw these augers into the ground to anchor it to the ground, if you see here. These are just little augers that have gone into the ground by turning this around by the power feed to physically anchor this bed into the ground. And what this is, is that this is just a rack that contains a bunch of pieces of like drill steel. It's not for drilling, but it's like drill steel, just a tube with a, a male at one end and a female um, connection at the top end, screw connections at the top and bottom ends. Uh, what these guys here are doing here, these are all the tubes, but they're threading the um, the data acquisition line down all of pre-threading it down all of these tubes uh, to get to the tip, which is this conical tip, which is then put in the ground. These are then loaded onto this tray, and physically one of these is pushed into the ground at two centimeters a second, and as it's going into the ground. The next one, with the tether on it, is placed on the top and screwed on, and so that when it reaches the end of the stroke, then the stroke quickly recedes up to the top, grabs the top, and then keeps on pushing it. And so, meanwhile, you're adding another length, and so it keeps on adding. We will look at that in due course. Um, the probe, uh, which no doubt you'll find amusing, you might recognize what that's the probe. You might recognize what's on the probe. So this is the uh, tip. It measures the force at this location. This is the friction sleeve, and it measures the force that's applied here. So by uh, looking at those two forces, you can discriminate what is applied against this tip and what is applied as friction on this sleeve. This little element here is a porous stone which allows you to measure the fluid pressure. And because you don't want any air bubbles in that porous stone, you pre-soak it with um, silicon oil or water and then seal it. So this is a condom which is on top of here to seal the um, uh, fluid inside this. And as it's physically pushed into the ground, this just gets ripped off and uh, it's left open to uh, the outside. So it's so on the ground is sitting all this rod, and the green stuff going through it is just the data acquisition. You can see there's a, a male connection there, there's a female connection there. It's tapered so that the when you screw it in, it doesn't get jammed. And if we continue, ultimately this Michael Fitzgerald's feet. This is how it's done. So this is this is it's ready to go. This is the tip that's on there. Uh, with its protection. Um, this is the first rod that's attached to it. This is the umbilical data part that comes out of it. So what it will be done is it'll be put on the hole. This is the ram that physically pushes it down into the ground. And um, once it's down at the bottom of its stroke, you'll have added another piece on there. 
it comes up to the top, grabs at the top, and then just continues it with, without, without almost a break. So this is it. It's going to drive it into the ground. I guess this is not a movie. This is. This is the rack of all the spare rod on the right hand side that gets added. It goes into the ground. I guess they're not doing it. They're not doing it continuously. It gets pushed into the ground. And then once it's gone all the way, you add the next one. It doesn't go that far. We've seen that. So there's another movie here. So this is Thumbs. Again, I'll close this off. Actually, the quality might not be so good. So this is the same kind of deal, but a much bigger rig. So these Geoprobe rigs are things that uh, um, can be operated by a regular Joe or Jane, I suppose. Uh, but this is a larger one. It's the uh, University of Michigan's rig. And this is a, a very specific uh, cone penetration test. So what it is, is called the vision cone. And so what it is, is a cone like we talked about. But instead of, uh, let me pause it, instead of just being a cone, what it has behind it, I think about half a meter behind the tip, is it has this little um, video camera. So what you see here is a sapphire window, just like well, no one, none, none of your generation wears watches anymore. But it's basically a watch glass. Um, this little white thing here is a, an LED that illuminates the scene. And physically, this is just pushed into the ground behind the probe. So it's about half a meter behind the probe. It's self-illuminated, and it just looks at what you're going through. So are we going through clay? Are we going through sand? Are we going through silt? Uh, are there immiscible fluids, denapples moving around as we go through this? And you're able to use this for site investigation. And so this is just using that particular probe. So you can see these are just a couple of two LED bulbs that you can see here. There's a, a CCD camera in here and all the electronics is housed in here to be able to capture the information. It gets ported up to the surface and it gets shown on a little um, TV screen which is sitting on the rig. Uh, as we go through this. Let me move along maybe. This is kind of the, the business end of what's going on. So this is the, uh, the rams that push down the, the probe. Oops. By that thing physically going down. And we'll see it in action in due course, I think. Goes through the bottom of the bed of the truck. I'm not doing much now. This is the guy from Hogan Togler. And this is, it doesn't get the frame up very well because it's of the, um, the video camera's taking it at a certain uh, frequency and it's being played and refreshed at a certain frequency and it doesn't match very well. And let's see if it's doing. The data acquisition equipment on its side. Going through the floor of the rig. So, so this is um, again the same deal. So in this case, this is a piece of uh, bicycle inner tube, just cut to go around this porous cone to be able to keep it saturated. It'll just get ripped off as soon as it gets pushed into the ground. The little bead at the end of this is a piece of silicon oil, a drop of silicon oil. Again, this is the friction sleeve here and the end bearing. And this is it just going to be pushed into the ground. Don't be too impatient. I want to show a portion where it's being pushed. So. Coming 
along. Still not pushed, I guess I should. Maybe I'll zip through this. What I want to do is show it in action. So yeah, this is the, the stage that's physically pushed into the earth, going into the ground now. And maybe not continuously, there's water coming out from around it. Uh, I want to show a part, and I don't know whether I have it, where the new pipe is being added onto it. Data acquisition. So that's just the rod that's in the bottom of, yeah, okay. So this is the stage that's going down. So it's actually in the ground. It's gone down. It's um, got water in it coming up from the hole. It's at the bottom of its frolicking. So maybe I don't see it going down. And that's, yeah. So yeah, so maybe that's all you get to see. So this physically goes down, it drives the tube at the bottom of it. Once it goes down to the base, you screw another piece of tube on it. Don't need to see what's happening in the evening. And this is dismantling the um, Tube. Actually, that's not a bad view of the whole thing, right? So this is the um, the cone. This is the tubing. I guess it won't get larger. This is the bicycle inner tube to seal it. This is the uh, video camera, which I think is probably half a meter behind it, something like that, which recorded what's going on. And uh, with that information, it allows you to be able to say something about the materials you're going through just by contrasting the end bearing, the sleeve friction, and the fluid pressures that it get generated at the tip, it allows you to say something quantitatively about the material you're going through, uh, both in terms of what the material is, but also in terms of its permeability as well. And I think that's probably it. So I think that is it. Okay. Not it. Perfect. That concludes our <laughs> our adventure day. My my uh, computer has hung, so don't know if it'll change. Anyway, so the bottom line is that um, when we're dr drilling in soil and rock, we have different methods to do it: in soil augering, hollow stem augers, or um, percussion or tricone bit drilling. Uh, if we're drilling in rock, we have percussion drilling or Coring. Coring is the only one of those would actually give us samples directly as the drilling technique. If we want to get samples out of the ground otherwise, then we have to use in soils um, a split spoon, which is a thick wall sampler in sands, which is physically driven into the ground, which gives us a disturbed sample. Uh, in clays, we can get an undisturbed sample by using a thin wall sampler, which is a Shelby tube, which is physically pushed into the ground and then taken back to the lab. Uh, and use whatever we want to use it for. Uh, and if we want to also do things like measure uh, in situ properties or recover pristine samples from different isolated zones, then what we could use is either piezometers or uh, packers that isolate locations of piezometers. And we talked about what those are. Uh, if we want in SANS only, to be able to do continuous profiling without drilling, then we can use cone penetration testing, which is what we just looked at in terms of these uh, movies and the techniques. And the technique's quite broadly used now uh, and is quite accessible because there are a number of companies that make these machines that are quite affordable and are um, re readily available. 
and it works on the principle that if you can relate the end bearing and the sleeve friction forces, the fluid pressures, to different measurements in different materials, you can use those metrics to be able to define exactly what you're going through. And uh, if you're able to measure that, you can also, in addition, use it to calculate things like permeability uh, in situ. And so that gives us an ability to be able to reconstruct, if you like, the kinds of profiles that you've used in your assignments, which have just magically uh, appeared. The, the final part of this is that in addition to so-called direct investigation, where you physically drill a hole and take a sample and have some surety, I guess, of what's there, you can also use geophysics to be able to do the similar things. And so the benefits of geophysics are that the disadvantage is you don't have a physical core uh, or a physical sample that you've retrieved to be able to assure that what's down there is there. But what it does allow you to do is that instead of taking a sample along a very specific trajectory, which might be only an inch in diameter and say 50 feet long, and your site might be a couple of acres, the volume of that relative to your site is trivial, right? That's sampling size. And so unless you have lots of holes around your site, you're never quite sure what's there. What geophysics does is allows you to fill in the three-dimensional part that you can't access by drilling or direct sampling by indirect methods and by looking at using geophysical signals, either the seismic velocity or the dielectric constant, which is measured by uh, radar, uh, or by the electrical re resistance, which is measured by electrical methods, or the presence of metal, which is measured by a magnetometer, or by contrasts in the gravitational constant, such as you know big voids in cast cars, which is to be measured by how the acceleration due to gravity changes at very fine resolution over this area. If you can measure those signals and relate those signals to different materials, then you can start filling in the spaces between the boreholes where you have absolute calibration because you physically recovered samples. The geophysics also goes through those locations as well, and so you can use those to calibrate the rest of your site to be able to figure out how those materials are distributed, whether they're continuous, whether they're discontinuous, whether there's a fault, whether there's washouts, whether there's channels, etc. At larger scales uh, than you can um, sample with uh, direct investigation.